Perfect, perfect. So first of all, thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers for accepting our paper into this very interesting conference. Today, I'm going to talk about capital controls, domestic macroprudential policy, and the bank lending channel of monetary policy. This is joint work with Marta Lopez Pineros from the Central Bank of Colombia, Jose Luis Pedro from Imperial College and UPF, and Paul Soto from the FDIC in Washington. So a bit of motivation for our work. To start with, uh, we know that, especially from the perspective of emerging economies, episodes of large capital inflows tend to be associated to credit booms, which are important predictors of financial crisis. Second, exposure to the global financial cycle and to large capital inflows might in practice limit the effectiveness of local monetary policy, as well as the effectiveness of national financial policies that aims at fostering financial stability. Taking this consideration into account, uh, nowadays several policymakers, including most notably the IMF, as well as a large class of theoretical models, advocate using prudential capital controls, especially when room for standard macro policy is exhausted. However, despite the uh, renewed interest in this policy after the last financial crisis, there is still limited empirical evidence about its effects and its interaction with domestic macroprudential measures especially when it comes to uh, empirical evidence based on rich micro-level data set. And this is where our paper tries to bring some, some contributions. In particular, what we do is exploiting a specific episode of capital controls introduced in Colombia in May of 2007 during a major credit boom alongside domestic macroprudential policies, namely an increase in reserve requirements on domestic deposit funding. We analyze the two policies in conjunction through the lens of credit registry data that will allow us to analyze the universe of commercial lending at the loan level. In particular, we try to answer two baseline and critical questions. First, do capital controls and or domestic macroprudential policies strengthen the transmission of monetary policy rates to credit supply? That is the so-called bank lending channel of monetary policy. Second, we also try to understand whether capital controls and domestic macroprudential measures complement each other in slowing down credit booms, which ultimately requires understanding whether they affect credit supply through two distinct channels. I will give you a preview of the findings uh, of our paper in the next slide, but let me first explain why we think that Colombia is a very interesting case study for the questions ahead. First, Colombia was experiencing a sharp credit boom, at least from 2006. Here, the black line depicts the annual growth rate of commercial lending. You can see that by the end of 2005, the growth rate was 10%. In 2007, quarter one, however, it went up to more than 25%. At the same time, the central bank uh, tried to react by raising the local policy rate from 6 to 8%, roughly over the same period but without any effect on, uh, on the growth rate of commercial lending up to the introduction of macroprudential policy in May of 2007. At the same time, there was also an increase in capital inflows, especially non-FDI capital inflows uh, that are in blue bars in this chart. And notice that this increase occurs when the uh, local policy rate hike implies an increasing trend in the Colombia versus US uh, policy rate differentials, OK? So that there is an interest rate wedge between Colombia and the global financial centers. Relatedly, there is also a sharp appreciation of the peso against the US dollar, as signaled by the declining backline that uh, defines the peso versus US dollars exchange rate in terms of pesos per one unit of US dollar. The central bank finally reacted with two policy shocks. The first being capital controls, which would target banks' foreign uh, liquidity, in particular in foreign currency. And second, with an increase in reserve requirements in domestic deposits, that would therefore target domestic liquidity. On top of this very interesting uh, environment, we have very rich micro level data, including the domestic credit registry that will include loan level information on the firm bank uh, outstanding stock of debt. And second, we also have access to bank supervisory data by which we can proxy uh, the volume of FX funding 
and domestic deposit funding so that we can track bank level exposure to capital controls and the increase in reserve requirements on domestic deposits. All right, having explained the um, environment in which our analysis takes place, I will summarize now our findings. First, we find that capital controls strengthen the bank lending channel of monetary policy, and by doing so, they also reduce banks' risk taking. The mechanism operates through a carry trade lending strategy by banks. In particular, as we saw before, an increase in the local policy rate widens the uh, Colombia versus US policy rate di differential, incentivizing banks to borrow in cheap US dollar and to redirect credit supply in more expensive peso lending. The results are in fact robust to using both the local policy rate and the policy rate spread between Colombia and US, and moreover, we find evidence that the carry trade is especially strong when there are larger deviations from the core interest parity. And moreover, the credit supply expansion that are associated to, to the carry favors disproportionately riskier and or opaque companies so that they also imply risk taking in lending. The role of capital controls here is to tax foreign liquidity and break the carry trade therefore helping in reestablishing a more negative relation between the local policy rate and domestic credit supply. A second finding of our paper is that the increase in reserve requirements on domestic deposits has a strong direct effect on credit supply rather than an indirect one through the interaction with monetary policy rates. Once again, the cuts are stronger for riskier and or opaque companies so that we have a further reduction in risk taking by banks. Finally, we try to understand whether the two policies basically affect credit supply through two distinct channels. And we try to address this demand by looking at the whether uh, foreign debt and domestic deposit funding are substitute sources of bank financing. This is not an entirely trivial demand uh, question because uh, the sum of the two sources of finding account for roughly 60% of banks' total assets. And in fact, we find that they are substitute in the sense that banks that rely more on effects funding rely less on domestic deposits and vice versa. So that in practice, those financial institutions that are more affected by capital controls are less impacted by the uh, re increase in the reserve requirements on domestic deposits and vice versa. This tells us that if you want to tame a boom, which is fueled by both, by both uh, foreign and domestic liquidity, that are therefore the two intermediate objectives of macroprudential policy, you need two policy instruments that are in fact capital controls and reserve requirements or, or, the, or domestic macroprudential policies more in general. And with this observation, we establish a Timberg and Prudential just very briefly, uh, our contribution to the, literature, to the literature, we first contribute to the very broad literature on the bank lending channel of monetary policy. In particular here, our main innovation is to show that capital controls strengthen the bank lending channel of monetary policy by reducing carry trade lending strategy by banks. These strategies are in particular, especially sensitive to interest rate differentials that have also been uh, a recent, uh, um, that have also received a lot of attention in recent papers. Second, we also contribute to the equally uh, broad uh, literatures on capital controls and macroprudential policies. Here, our main innovation is to analyze through rich micro-level data set, both capital controls and domestic macroprudential policies in conjunction. And our results on the Tim Bergen prudential rule actually resonates the theoretical intuition from Korinek and Sander in their very nice 2016 JIE paper that in practice, uh, when you have a boom, which is driven by both foreign and domestic liquidity, you can use these two type of policies in, in a complementary way to slow down the boom. All right, so for the uh, rest of the talk, I will first briefly describe the two policies, next summarize the data in one slide, and eventually jump to the empirical analysis. So capital controls were introduced in May of 2007. They took the form of a six month, 40% unremunerated reserve requirement or URR on effects borrowing. In practice, they would apply to foreign currency bank debt, 
and on portfolio uh, investment inflows, FDI is being excluded. So how does the URR work in practice? Assume you are a firm, you want to borrow $100 from abroad, then under capital controls, clearly uh, conditionally on doing so, you will have to deposit 30% of the nominal amount of debt, which is $40 in this example, in an unremunerated account at the Central Bank of Colombia for six months. Okay, so this was a, a heavy taxation of FX debt inflows at the time where we have seen that the monetary policy rate was as high as 8%. In principle, there was a possibility to withdraw these funds before the expiration of the six month deadline. But for doing so, you will have to pay uh, heavy commissions equal, for instance, to 9.4% of the deposits during the first month of the reserve requirement. Jointly uh, with capital controls, the central bank also introduced a new upper limit on financial institutions gross effects position that could not overcome uh, five times the regulatory capital of banks. Notice here the gross effects position is the sum of the assets and, uh, and liabilities that banks uh, accumulate in their balance sheets. Finally, uh, capital controls were eliminated in October of 2008 amid signs of slowdown due to the global unfolding of the financial crisis. Just a, a detail about this policy, it is important to keep in mind that the policy would apply to both banks and firms borrowing. And to the extent that the bank would borrow in dollar to actually lend in dollar, they would be excluded from paying these deposits. And here the rationale is that only the company would pay in order to avoid the single taxation, the double taxation, sorry, of a single effects that inflow that is intermediated by uh, the local banking system. Therefore, we have that capital controls would affect uh, the supply of peso loans that are financed with effects debt and you know banks uh, fully hedge their effects position so that under the regime of capital controls they will not only pay the tax but now be subject also to this new uh, limit on their gross effects position very briefly on the other policy which is the domestic uh, uh, macro uh, prudential policy clearly ordinary uh, reserve requirements were already in place before the policy shock uh, this would require to deposit a given fraction of savings and checking deposits in an account at the central bank, and these were uh, remunerated at current inflation rate. In May 7th of 2007, however, at the same time of capital controls, there was a new policy shock, namely the introduction of a marginal reserve requirement to be computed on top of the ordinary reserve requirement. Okay, this was a high tax, once again, uh, equal to 27% of savings and checking deposits. And importantly, this would apply on the volume of deposits on top of the level of May 7th of 2007, so that banks that were relying more on these sorts of finding would be more constrained during the boom. Capital, uh, the reserve requirements were eliminated, the marginal ones in August of 2008 here, the key takeaway from this slide is that around May of 2007, there is a shock that ultimately raised the cost of savings and checking deposits for local banks. In terms of the data, as already uh, explained, we have access to the credit registry. This provides us with the uh, information on the outstanding debt provided by a given bank to a given firm in a given quarter. Next, we have indicators or firm level risks and opaqueness that we will eventually use to understand whether there is risk taking in lending associated to our mechanisms. We also have access to bank's balance sheet data that allows us to uh, measure the bank level exposure to the two policies, either capital controls through FX funding or uh, domestic reserve requirements through the domestic deposit funding. We also have a broad list of microeconomic indicators, including uh, deviations from cover interest parity uh, that are basically borrowed from the famous Duen Schrager 2016 JOF paper. Our largest sample account for more than 110,000 firms and 30 banks whose balance sheets are consolidated across 12 major banking groups. And we can finally skip to the uh, empirical analysis. We first try to understand whether, in general, and during the period of implementation of capital controls and reserve requirements, there is a strengthening 
of the bank lending channel of monetary policy. We try to test this hypothesis through a very simple model, admittedly, in which the left-hand side variable is given by the log volume of credit provided by a given bank B to a firm F in a given quarter. The main regressor of interest is the lag local policy rate. We allow it to take to have a, a differential impact on the volume of credit before and after the interact the implementation of prudential measures. Notice that a strengthening of the bank lending channel implied by the implementation of the two policies would suggest that beta 2 is negative, meaning that when you have prudential measures in place, an increase in the local policy rate has a more negative bearing on the volume of credit. We next also uh, augment the model with uh, macro controls interacted with the post dummy, bank controls, and firms times bank fix effect. Our sample runs from 2005 to mid 2008. We avoid including further uh, quarters in order to uh, avoid contamination of the effects of the policies with those, with, with those of the crisis. But if we were to shorten or lengthen our sample, we will find similar findings. All right, so these are the results from the estimation of the simple model. Here we present several specifications of the model that are progressively saturated from column one to five where I report the baseline version that I just commented in previous slide. Notice that across all these versions of the model, during the period of implementation or after the implementation of prudential measures, an increase in the local policy rate is associated to a more negative reaction of credit. Therefore, there is uh, evidence that actually suggests a strengthening of the bank lending channel of monetary policy. And interestingly and surprisingly, we find that before the application of the policies, an increase in the local policy rate is associated to an expansion in credit. These findings are robust to using alternative proxies of monetary policy rates, including importantly, uh, the policy rate spread between Colombia and US that we are gonna lever in the rest of the analysis very much, but also other, other proxies. We run a bunch of robustness checks I will avoid commenting it for reasons of time constraint. Maybe during the QA, we can come back on this if there are questions on the sensitivity of our model. All right, so next we try to uncover a mechanism that can explain the just documented findings, meaning the evidence that the bank lending channel seems to be operative only under the period of implementation of capital controls and reserve requirements. And once again, we uh, lever a mechanism that will label carry trade lending, by which when there is a policy rate hike, there is also an increase in the Colombia versus US rate differential so that with capital mobility, we have that Colombian banks can borrow in cheap US dollar and lend in expensive basis, thereby gaining the interest rate differentials. Capital controls tax affects borrowing. We have seen this, we, this was a substantial tax and therefore might disincentivize the carry, helping reestablishing the more negative relation that we've seen in the previous slides between variation in the local policy rate and credit supply. The key intuition for our identification strategy is that carry trade strategy requires additional US borrowing by banks. So, so that in practice, you would expect uh, under our hypothesis, carry trade being stronger for banks with easier access access to FX debt that we proxy through higher ex ante reliance on FX funding. And in fact, we run the model where as usual, we have as a left-hand side, as, as left side variable, the log volume of firm bank debt regressed against the full interaction between the policy rate spread and the share of bank assets, which is financed through FX borrowing. Once again, we allow for a differential effect before and after the introduction of capital controls. Notice, under our hypothesis, beta one would be positive, meaning that uh, when there is a policy rate spread, banks with easier access to FX debt expand credit supply. If capital controls as a negative bearing on this mechanism and actually disincentivizes, we have to beta two would be negative. We augment the model also with the full interaction between FX borrowing, macro controls, and the post dummy. And importantly, we augment the model with the interaction between the policy rate spread 
the usual post dummy and a full vector of bank controls. Okay, so this vector of bank controls in particular will include both saving and checking deposits. So the two sources of bank finance of bank finding that were taxed through the increased on, on the reserve rate requirements. So that in practice here, we are running a horse race where we allow both capital controls and domestic macro prudential measures to influence the interaction between monetary policy rates and credit supply. As we will see in a couple of slides, it turns out that only capital controls matter. And this is why I'm focusing already on this mechanism. Finally, and very briefly, we use firm times bank fixed effects and firm time fixed effect that absorb firm fundamental shocks. Uh, these in practice, uh, the use of this last set of uh, firm time fixed effects allows us to identify our coefficient of interest from the comparison of the credit that is provided to a specific firm in a given point in time by banks with different reliance on effects borrowing and depending on the on the level uh, of the policy rate spread so that in practice we have within firm comparison. These are the results from the estimation of the models. Once again, they are progressively saturated from column one to uh, column five, where we uh, have the most robust version of the model that I have just commented. Across all these versions of the model, there is strong evidence in favor of the carry trade hypothesis before capital controls, therefore under capital mobility, an increase in the policy rate spread is associated to a relative expansion in credit supply across banks with higher reliance on FX funds. Capital controls uh, disincentivize and eventually break this mechanism as suggested by the negative coefficients on top of this table. Here we zoom into column five, where I show the full interaction between the policy rate spread, the post dummy, and the two sources of uh, liquidity that were taxed by the increase in the marginal reserve requirements. And you can clearly see that the interaction is not significant, okay? Suggesting that domestic macroprudential measures do not kind of significantly interact uh, with the monetary policy rate transmission. The coefficients that I've just displayed are not only uh, statistically significant, but also economically meaningful. For instance, following a one percentage point increase in the monetary policy rate spread, we have that before capital controls are introduced, banks with a one standard deviation higher effects funding increase credit supply by 3.8%, uh, whereas uh, under capital controls, they reduce credit supply by 3.5 percentage points. Once again, a whole list of robustness checks. I will skip them to further dig into our mechanism. As I already emphasized at the beginning of this introduction, banks tend to fully hedge their effects risk. Therefore, carry trades should be especially responsive to uh, a component of the interest rate differentials, uh, which allow actually uh, positive returns under fully hedged effects risk, that is, should be especially responsive to deviations from the core interest parity. Therefore, what we do is decomposing the three month sovereign spread, which highly correlates with the policy rate spreads into a forward premium component and a component associated to deviations from the core interest parity. And as you can see, in column three of this table, you have that carry trade is especially sensitive to deviations from the cover interest parity, both before and after the introduction of capital controls. Finally, we try to understand also whether there are heterogeneous effects across firms of this carry trade lending strategy mechanism. We sort companies uh, according to several proxies of firm risk. In particular, we first proxy firms uh, we first proxy firms in terms of ex-ante debt yields. Here, firms in the first quartile are relatively safer than firms in the second, third, and fourth quartiles. Also, we have a proxy of liquidity risk, which is ex-ante reliance on short-term debt, and another proxy of, uh, of credit risk, that is whether a firm ever defaulted uh, before the application of capital controls. And finally, a proxy of firm transparency given by a dummy for whether a company balance sheet is supervised or not under the assumptions that uh, a firm with supervised balance sheets are more transparent. 
And here we find that carry trade lending allocates re relatively more credit supply to firms that have higher credit risk and the liquidity risk. These companies are also uh, more cut, uh, um, actually receive larger cuts in credit supply uh, under capital controls. And the same is true for opaque companies or companies with previous defaults. So capital controls here is associated to a reduction in risk taking in lending by banks. All right, so very briefly, the analysis of the reserve requirements entails a very standard diff in diff exercise whereby we borrow an identification strategy from Quasi uh, to 2008 AR paper. We regress the log volume of firm bank debt against the interaction between a post dummy and an ex-ante proxy of bank level exposure to the marginal reserve requirement, which is given by the sum of saving and checking deposits. The model is once again uh, augmented with firm time bank and firm time time fixed effects so that we fully absorb for, full, for firm fundamental demand shocks. Notice that under the assumption that the increase in the marginal reserve requirement is associated to a reduction in credit supply, you would expect beta being negative. Okay, so we estimate this model, once again, with many different specifications, across all of them, you find a negative influence of the marginal reserve requirement on credit supply. And this result there holds. You, you have uh, less than four minutes left. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. And uh, this result also holds when you try to decompose the total volume of domestic deposit funding into either saving or checking deposits. Once again, this uh, uh, is associated to an economically meaningful effect. For instance, a one standard deviation increase in overall uh, the domestic deposit finding is associated to a five point percentage point ex post cut in credit supply. And the effect seem to be stronger for the tax on checking deposits, which are more short term funding. Once again, a whole list of, of uh, robustness checks. I will devote, uh, okay, no, then we talked, sorry, also about the risk taking changes that is associated to this policy. And once again, we, uh, sort companies uh, based on the usual proxies that we saw in the last table. And in this case, we find that there are larger cuts in credit supplies induced by uh, the policy for firms with higher ex ante, either credit or, or liquidity risk, and also for, once again, opaque companies with unsupervised uh, balance sheet. Finally, we try to understand whether the two policies affect credit supply through two distinct channels. Okay? And this requires understanding whether the two sources of funding that are taxed with the two policies are substitute or complements in banks' balance sheet. In this chart, you have on the y axis the FX funding at the bank level, rescaled by total assets. And on the x axis, you have the sum of saving and checking deposits. And you can see that the two sources of liquidity are very sharply and, and negatively correlated across banks, which suggests that companies that are more impacted by capital controls are less influenced by the domestic reserve requirements and vice versa. You can see that the two channels are independent, also from this formal test when we run actually, where we allow both channels to influence credit supply at the same time, and they operate uh, kind of distinctively on credit supply and they both survive this test. All right, so this last observation uh, lead me to the I mean, conclusion of our work. We exploit uh, um, a specific episode of, uh, of conjunct use of capital controls and domestic macroprudential measures plus very rich micro level data set. And we find that capital controls strengthen the bank lending channel of monetary policy, reducing in particular and disincentivizing carry trade lending strategy by banks that are associated to an increase in banks risk taking. On the other hand, domestic macroprudential um, measures, in particular an increase in the reserve requirements on domestic deposits have a direct effect on credit supply rather than through the interaction with monetary policy rates, also in this case, associated to a reduction in the risk taking by banks. 
The two policies affect credit supply through two distinct channels, meaning that they target sources of liquidity that are substitutes in bank's balance sheet. And this leads us to the last observation, the last result of our study that states that if you have a boom, which is driven by two sources of liquidity that are domestic and foreign liquidity, that therefore constitutes two distinct intermediate objectives of, of, of macroprudential policy, then you will need two ma macroprudential instruments that are in particular capital controls and reserve requirements. And this is what we label as a timber and uh, prudential rule. And with this, I leave the floor to the discussants.